Hi, I'm Dan Costa, Editor-in-Chief of PCMag.com, and this is Fast Forward, where we have conversations about living in the future. We are at the Taconomy Conference in Half Moon Bay, and my guest today is Ken Washington. He is the CTO of Ford and the Vice President of Research for, and of Research and Advanced Engineering. We're going to talk about automation, we're going to talk about AI, we're going to talk about quantum computing, and then we're going to talk about scooters. So let's get straight to it. Ken, like, um, Americans are dying, and are, Americans are, are, are suffering under terrible commutes. I've got some data to share with you. South Dakota has the shortest average commute in the, in the country with 16.5 minutes. The longest average commute is in Washington, D.C. at 43 minutes. Um, is this going to get worse as time goes on, or is it going to get better, and, and how is Ford going to help? It's our aspiration at Ford that it's going to get better because we're, we're approaching the introduction of smart cars into environments that are increasingly intelligent as a design problem. And you know, we're focused on designing the solution as, as a system so that when people have access to this new technology, have access to autonomous vehicles, they're designed to enter society in a way that uh, makes your commute experience better as opposed to worse. You can be guaranteed that if you don't design the introduction of technology into society with that intent, um, you, you, you're just resting on luck to, to have the experience be better. We're not, we don't want to count on luck, and so we're approaching it that way. That's why we went to Miami to do our development and testing um, long before we're ready to introduce autonomous vehicle into the city. For people that aren't familiar with what you've been doing in Miami, talk about how, how long that's been going on down there. So it started over a year ago, and we started by driving vehicles that were not autonomous and um, asking the question, how would people interact with the vehicle? What are the human-centered need, human needs for their commutes? Uh, how does it interact with the parking system in the city? How, does it, how do the street lights time, the timing of the street lights work relative to the, the automation that's coming in the autonomous vehicle? Those are just a few of the kind of questions that we wanted to have good answers to that we can then design our, our service around because the, these, these vehicles, these autonomous vehicles that, that we're working on are going to be part of a uh, service and the service is going to do potentially much more than just move a person from one point to another. Um, we wanted to interact with other services they might want to have access to in the city um, and, um, and you know they're going to have to interact with it with some kind of a, of a routing application and all of these are design are points in the system that we're working on designing. Why did you pick Miami? Well it's a combination of factors. One is we really like the idea of, of being in a, in a um, in a community where we can serve the needs of, of a diverse de, uh, uh, demographic, um, people who are in un, you know, underrepresented minorities as well as as uh, uh, a fairly dense urban environment. Uh, the good weather helped. You know, we we don't want to take on too much for the first mm -hmm. implementation, and uh, and then the, the, the city that that welcomed the uh, the the partnership, and so uh, a very forward leaning. Uh, uh, government officials in the city are willing to work with us. So those factors uh, made it a pretty straightforward choice. So all the, all the major automakers are working on autonomous vehicles. Um, technology startups are working on autonomous vehicles. Uh, I've seen it, I've, been in a, I've ridden in a number of these cars. Um, how different is the technology that's powering them? Are, is everybody building their own map? Is everybody using their own flavor of LiDAR? And are we going to wind up with, a bunch, with vehicles that are um, very different from one another. Well, I think there are a couple things going on here. One is the actual technology itself of how to replace the physical act of doing the driving with the actuators and the software that, that can that can follow a safe path. That part of the equation is is pretty uniform. It's pretty straightforward. It's it, it's a hard problem. Um, but you're not going to see a whole lot of variability in how people are approaching that problem. It's pretty well known that you need a prior map to do level four autonomy. It's pretty well known that you need a, a very robust sensor set. Um, not everyone's going to use the same radar or LIDAR sensors. Certainly not everyone's going to use the same cameras. But the whole idea is similar. Mm -hmm. it's, you, know, you get sensors that can sense the environment and then you plan a path based on, on the comparison of what it sees with what it what, what it knew was there before from the prior map. Where it deviates is, is in how you introduce the, the technology into the service. I, we believe that that's going to be very different. And it's, it's going to be all around designing the experience 
uh, based on your understanding of the human need and the, your interaction with the rest of the world that the, the vehicle is in. And you know, we're taking our time to get that part of it right. And if you get that part of it right, we think that experience is going to be differentiating. And we're betting on that being the, 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 the part of the uh, approach that's going to give us an advantage. So what would be the opposite of that? Would it be the, the Tesla model of we're building cars and we're releasing updates and it's a little more autonomous as every week goes by? Well, you know, I'm not very close to the details of how all of our competitors are approaching the problem, so I'm a little hesitant to, to, to point at somebody who's the opposite of the model. But I do want to, to clarify that I think you have to be a little careful in mixing apples and, and carrots. Uh, you know, the, the, the Tesla technology is a driver assist technology where you have a driver behind the wheel and that person is being assisted by a technology that's increasingly capable. We're taking a, a very similar approach in our driver assist technology where we're providing over there updates eventually and we're making the assistance to the driver better and better with each release. Um, we think that's very important. It's going to save lives. We think it's going to increase the joy of driving and, and uh, it's an important part of our strategy. That's on a very different trajectory than than the ride service autonomous technology that we're providing uh, to the cities that we're working with, so uh, you know, we think mixing the two is 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 um, you know is not the right thing to do. Fair enough. The uh, are we getting to the point? So these cars are they're being demoed. They're on roads now. Uh, depending on where you live, people have seen autonomous cars on the roads. Um, where what's the state of regulation here? Like, do is it, have we gotten to the point where we actually need? laws and rules that everybody will follow? Yeah, so it's very much a work in progress and it's a, it's a topic of a, a, you know, very vibrant, ongoing uh, discussion with, with, the, with the policymakers. Uh, and we're very um, uh, forward leaning in, in approaching and interacting with the, with the uh, policymakers um, so that that conversation can be brought to, to fruition. Um, but it's still very early days. You're spot on that we absolutely need to have a set of policies and principles that the whole industry can can take advantage of. We think it would be a, an absolute disaster if it, every individual company went off and did their own thing. Um, and it'd be almost as bad if every state had their own set of rules and it wasn't a sort of a federal policy layer. So we're, we're really encouraging the policy uh, makers to come together and create a, a federal strategy for autonomous vehicles. I mean, I've been told that the, the technology is on track and we're talking two years out that these things will be commercially available. Um, it doesn't seem like that we are two years out from some kind of cohesive national plan that, that lawmakers could agree to. Well, I think you're seeing some signs of momentum, and I'm cautiously optimistic because you know we've we've had some very positive discussions with, with, uh, uh, with the government, both state and and, and federal. So I, I'm cautiously optimistic. I think as you start seeing more and more vehicles enter into pilot phases, like what we're doing in Miami and what we're going to do with our testing in Washington D.C. Um, I think that's going to raise the intensity of of the need and. And uh, yeah, I think the, this country has a history of responding when the need is there. So you think you're optimistic? I am. I mean, I think our elected officials respond to, to the public's uh, pressure. When, mm -hmm. when the public sees that, oh my gosh, this is really going to happen, mm -hmm. I, I think there's still a lot of denial about whether it's going to really happen. Yep. And as, as the public sees the vehicles and they begin to actually ride in them, and they see that these experiences can be good experiences, uh, that's where we're focused. We're focused on bringing these vehicles into a uh, into a, a city and working with the city to make the experience good. You know, we've tagged the the the, the winning aspiration at Ford of of being the world's most trusted mobility company, building smart vehicles for a smart world. And every word in that in that winning aspiration is important. So you, you earn that trust one ride at a time, one experience at a time. And that's what we're gonna focus on because then the public will begin to see, oh, these vehicles actually can be good. Okay, how, how are we gonna actually turn it into something that we can have access to on a regular basis? That's gonna create the, the pressure on the elected officials to, uh, to accelerate.
So you mentioned Ford being a mobility company, building vehicles, you didn't say cars. Um, just uh, recently you bought a, a electric scooter company, That's right. a dockless scooter company. Um, a really hot segment, uh, Lime and Bird have raised close to a billion dollars in capital. You didn't spend that much uh, to get your company, but um, a lot of people will be surprised that Ford now owns a scooter company. T tell me why this is not just a fad. Well, first of all, I. I, I don't think they should have been surprised because we've been talking for a long time about the fact that we are focused on mobility and the fact that we are, uh, it's in our DNA to democratize the, the ability to access uh, affordable and reliable and safe transportation and mobility services. Uh, it's kind of like what Henry Ford did over 100 years ago, but it's just the modern day technology fueled version of it. And so uh, it should have been kind of like, well, of course Ford bought a, an electric scooter company uh, because it can be part of a multimodal smart design solution for helping people get where they need to go. You don't always need to be in a, in a car that you own uh, and so now you can be in a car that you're hailing with a, the, the autonomous service we're working on and now you can be on an electric scooter for a, you know a short distance and if we have all of those at our disposal as we design the experiences in a city, we can design them to all work together and to work with the digital uh, tools that, that you hold in your hand. With, in, in our case, we're, we're really excited about how Fort Pass has continued to get better and better. So you could imagine one day we'll, we'll have all of that tied together in an easy to use, uh, smart application that takes advantage of of the massive amounts of information that we'll have from using these services and vehicles, so that's that's our that's our. our and thinking. you were and you were selective with the, the the scooter company that you're going to buy that you bought. It's Spin, and they go about things a little bit differently than Bird and and, and Lime do. Um, and I think you're happy with your. We're very your happy. We're very happy with with because they with do Spin. things a little differently. Yeah, they 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 uh, work with cities in, kind of in the same way we do, mm -hmm. and um, so we think it's a very good cultural fit. Um, we, we are very passionate about um, working as a partner with cities in providing mobility solutions that are going to work for people that live, play, and, and work in the, in the cities. And, you know, SPIN approach, approached it the same way. They, they did not introduce their scooters into any city without first working with the city, and, and that, meant, that meant a lot to us. And so uh, we think it's going to be a good fit. So one of the topics that's come up at this conference is uh, the state of U.S. Uh, competition with China um, in terms of autonomous vehicles, in terms of AI, in terms of uh, just traditional consumer electronics manufacturing. Um, and, and you brought up some, some comments that like, you know, it, it is American companies are in a lot of ways being disadvantaged by the competitive landscape. Um, does that mean that we need to sort of look at how U.S. industrial policy works and maybe make some changes? I think it's I think it's a, a bit of a call call to arms to our to our, our government to to work with companies and and thinking more creatively about how we might take advantage of public private partnerships. Uh, that's always been an instrument available to us, but I th I think there's opportunity for us to be more strategic and more aggressive about it. Um, and one thing that's very important to us is we operate on a global stage, and so China is an extremely important market for us. And so as we go to China to market, we are going to market in that environment in a way that that works for us, uh, with our partners, our joint venture partners in China, with technology companies like. The, the Baidu Apollo platform that we are a very early member of that platform, founding uh, partner. Um, so our partnerships with companies and, and um, the technology companies in China is a part, and part of our playbook. Um, but the message that I was trying to convey here in, in the broader conversation we we're having in the other room is, is that when we're operating here in, in the U.S., um, we have to make our play here as competitive, or at least take advantage of all the tools at our disposal. And I think we're leaving a few options on the table. So I hope that our government and, and, and our companies can, can um, be, um, you know, look at that as an opportunity. Very good. The, um, I have to ask, uh, when is the Ford Bronco coming out? I, I, I hear we're going to get our, our actual looks at the next Ford Bronco in January. Um, there, I've seen lots of artist sketches online. Um, have you seen it? Do you know what it looks like? 
Well, as a, as a Ford executive, you know, I, I get to see early, early versions of it. So you just got to be patient to see the final, the final product. Uh, but what I can tell you is we're super excited about it being in our portfolio. Uh, we, we put together a pretty straightforward plan for, for, for executing our strategy. And that plan starts with having a winning portfolio. And in that winning portfolio, bringing the Bronco back was a really important thing for us to do. So we didn't want to just bring it back just to bring it back. We wanted to bring it back to really go after the, the consumers in that market who love adventure and the love, the feel of the, of the prior Bronco. Yeah. And we're hoping to, to scratch that as just right with this new, this new Bronco. I, so. I've been talking it up for six months now. And um, Great, I keep, keep doing that. I keep That's getting awesome. reminded that I should probably test drive it before I decide to buy it. <laughs> and um, I'll probably have to wait a couple of years for the, the used market to kick up, but I'm super excited to see it. Uh, Ken, I want to ask you the questions I ask everybody on the show. Um, is there a technological trend uh, that concerns you or that keeps you up at night? Well, um, there, there are a few. Um, so uh, concern is probably not the right word. I think it's, uh, it's, it's sort of interesting blend of, of excitement, but also con concern to some degree. And, and that's the technology of artificial intelligence. Uh, it's got such promise. Uh, and that promise can be both for good and for bad. And, and I, I think we've got a lot of work to do to find out how can we tap the, the good and really harness the power of artificial intelligence in our business and have it do more than you know, build robot cars. You know, it's got to be deeper than that to really impact society in a positive way. We think it can, it can propel the, 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 the future of how we build and design and engineer our products. It can change the efficiency of how we do our work. But at the same time, it raises lots of really difficult and challenging questions about the workforce and the need to retrain our workforce and, and, and what the demographics of our workforce is going to look like in the future when we've got all these AI-powered uh, tools and services. So I, you know, I think it's exciting. It's a game-changing technology. Um, but it raises lots of big questions that we've got to get on with answering. Yeah, I think a lot of people share that concern. Yeah. Um, is there an app or a service or a device or product that you use every day that still inspires wonder? Um, yeah, there are several. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very much a technology geek, as I should be, as being a CTO at Ford. Uh, but one that I really am pretty excited about is, is how we uh, can now um, weave technology into in our day-to-day -day lives in our homes. You know, our homes can be smarter than ever. And so I'm a bit of a smart home geek. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even though I know exactly kind of how all of it works, when you see it come to life and kind of do things for you, it always sparks wonder. So, I mean, like, what know. platform, what, what products are you using? Because the platforms aren't even built out yet. Yeah, they're all kind of, it's, it's, it's this sort of this hodgepodge collection of a bunch of do-it-yourself do do tools. So I, I use several of the do-it-yourself tools, ranging from Alexa to smart things to you know, Nest and other, other products and, uh, you know, the Ring doorbell and, you know, there are many that I use. Um, and, but what's really cool about it and what sparks the wonder in me is they can kind of all work together, yeah. right? And, and when, you, uh, when you wire it all up right and you program in the automations, it does things that, you know, I used to watch on TV, you know, in science fiction shows. And yeah. it's kind of cool to see it come to life. Yeah, it's coming to life, but it does help to be a CTO it, it, you <laughs> with have to a couple be a of advanced of... degrees in order to make it all work. It's, it's a lot harder for most people. There's some friction yeah. to get it to work, but, um, you know, the friction's kind of worth it. Um, I'm excited about the day when the friction goes away because then everyone can have it at, at a reasonable cost. I mean, it used to, you know, you used to have to make big investments to have smart homes, you know, these custom bespoke mm -hmm. smart home modules that people would build into luxury homes. And so it's very much like the model of, you know, early luxury cars, you had to be rich to have one. Yep. Today that's being democratized. And so you can buy smart home hubs now for a hundred bucks and, you know, sensors for 10 or 20 bucks. And so, uh, one day that friction is going to go away and, and the wonder of having your, your home have all this intelligence in it, it's going to be there. What's cool about that for Ford is that that's part of the smart world that we talk about. When we say smart vehicles for a smart world, when you pull your car in the garage, the smart home should know that it's there. Yeah. And um, when you pull up to the garage, the garage should just open. 
you, know, you shouldn't have to hit the little garage button. That's coming, and that's what we mean by smart vehicles in a smart world. That's why I'm excited about the wonder I see when I you know, wire together these smart home devices, because I know it's a signal of what's to come with the smart vehicle in a smart world. Very good. Well, Ken, thanks so much for taking the time to talk to me today. It's my pleasure. That's Fast Forward for today. If you want to see past episodes of this show, you can find them on PCMag.com, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, or pretty much anywhere fine podcasts are given away for free. Thanks so much. I'll see you in the future.